Fiducia Supercons, the ultimate takedown. Before we can even assail Fiducia Supercons itself, we first have to master situation ethics. To identify it, go over John Paul II's condemnations of it and identify its presence in Fiducia Supercons. After that, we're going to move on to criticisms of Fiducia Supercons, theological censures, and other criticisms. And that will constitute, of course, the formal cause. Then we'll move on to a meta-analysis of the other three causes, final cause, and this is in red because if you have very little time, this is where you want to go. But we're also going to touch on material cause, which again is situation ethics as the foundation, the basis for all the errors in this encyclical. And lastly, we'll end with a consideration of whether this is an implementation of authentic magisterium that would be efficient cause. First, situation ethics. With any Christological heresy, you want to be able to graph it somewhere on the pyramid of human nature given to us from Plato and Aristotle and also other places like Genesis 1 and certain places in the book of Revelation like the seven churches. It's also all throughout systematic theology anytime you have a group of seven. And if you want to know more about this, you can look at my video right here or in the video description. So situation ethics is going to have three integral parts and we're going to take these from three paragraphs in John Paul II's great moral encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, the Splendor of Truth. So, characteristics of situation ethics are complexity, creativity, and rudimentariness. These will be three cloaks that situation ethicists will overemphasize and hide underneath them so that they don't have to face the light of truth. So first, complexity. John Paul II writes, General moral norms, the situation ethicists continue, can't be expected to foresee and to respect all the individual concrete acts of the person in all their uniqueness and particularity. These authors stress the complexity of the phenomenon of conscience, complexity re profoundly related to the whole sphere of psychology and emotions. They're at the middle animal level, and then also in the individual social and cultural environment down at the physical level. So intellect and will is in fact simple, but they're going to play up the complexity so much that they're going to put a cloak under which to hide under. And of course, the devil is in the details, right? Part number two of situation ethics is going to be creativity. Back to the pyramid of human nature. We can distinguish in this pyramid intellectual from willful parts of the pyramid. And you can see the various faculties here at each level. But really, creativity is going to be in this top level of the pyramid where we have principles causing facts and acts revealing values. So these actually transcend and ex get expressed out in the animal and physical levels of reality. But in themselves, they really only exist up there at that top level. So that's what we're going to focus on throwing out the other two levels of the pyramid. And additionally, we're going to throw out the intellectual side because creativity really is only in the will. So this is going to be a cloak over the creative half of the rational top layer of the pyramid. John Paul II is going to write conscience, it's said by situation ethicists, leads them not so much to a meticulous observance of universal norms, so bye-bye intellectual half, as to a creative and responsible acceptance of the personal tasks entrusted to him by God. In their desire to emphasize the creative character of conscience, certain authors no longer call its actions intellectual judgments, as we used to, but now they call them just decisions. Only by making these decisions autonomously, i.e. without any moral norms, values, rules, laws, or anything, totally separate, um, would man be able to attain moral maturity as a drag queen. And he continues, based on a certain more concrete existential consideration. So when you hear existential, you want to think about existing right at the bottom layer of the rational level. So it's like dopamine drop, next dopamine drop, next dopamine drop, 100 points, 100 points, 100 points. So based on an existential consideration like this, then these ethicists will attempt to justify a creative hermeneutic according to which the moral conscience is in no way obliged to buy a particular negative precept because we're being creative and it's just a decision. So basically this is like a child saying, no, I'll create my expectations, my standards, my roles based on what I think my complex self is capable of in this complex situation. And therefore, blow apart all those rules judgments. I'll set the rules. Don't judge. So, of course, here we've created a cloak over the will so we can hide under it. 
but of course the devil does too. Next, rudimentariness. This is going to distinguish the higher level of reason from the lower level of reason. This will dwell upon the lower half of rationality where application of higher principles and top values gets applied down to actual situations. So we're going to have general precepts and then individual conscience operating underneath of that. John Paul II writes, a separation or even an opposition is thus established in some cases between the teaching of the precept, which is valid in general, and the norm of the individual conscience, which would in fact make the final decision. The final decision, right? So on this basis, an attempt is made to legitimize so-called pastoral solutions. Pastoral solutions, contrary to the teaching of the magisterium. So this is like the tortoise and the hare are really the inchworm and the hare. So the intellect could instantly know a principle and apply it instantly to all situations underneath of it, if it wanted to. But ethicists, like little children, want to say, oh, does it apply to this situation? What about this situation? What about this situation? Inch by inch by inch. And they can do that because human intellects are not angelic like angels. They don't instantly see all the ramifications. Rather, human intellects are discursive. They go application by application. If, therefore, if, therefore, if, therefore. And so this is going to put a cloak over the lower half of the intellect, the lower reason, so that they don't have to face the light. And, of course, the devil is in the details. But this mollycoddling, this bias in favor of childlike moral non-development is the opposite of what Ephesians 4 tells us is the goal of the moral life. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the whole mystical body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the perfect man, the mature manhood of Christ, at that top level of human reason. Therefore, we must not be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, situation, ethics, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. So here we finally have the three integral parts of situation ethics. We want to claim that circumstances and environment are too complex because we don't want to face the light. We want to claim that psychology and emotions are too because we don't want to face the light. We want to dwell on our own creativity because we don't want to face the light. And we want to inch by inch through application after application because we don't want to face the general light. So there you have the essence of situation ethics. Okay, now we're going to identify situation ethics in Fiducia Supplicans. Now to get any of this, you could just migrate over here to my website, rebukefrancis.com, click on Situation Ethics tab, then go down and click Fiducia Supplicans, which will put Fiducia Supplicans right up next to the appropriate paragraphs of Situation Ethics' description in JP2's Veritatis Splendor. You could also pick a different document instead, or you could click several documents at once so that you can compare them all the way across. And so that's how that works. This website of mine also has a 40-page academic rebuke of Pope Francis and numerous videos. So please like and share this website of mine by clicking one of these buttons up here. First, complexity. So in case you forgot, this is where complexity, it's those lower two levels. And green is lowest, pink and orange is the middle layer. So... Here we see in Fiducia Supplicans, quote, paragraph 25, the church mover must shy away from resting its pastoral praxis on the fixed nature of certain doctrinal or disciplinary schemes. Instead, when they lead to a narcissistic and authoritarian elitism, whereby instead of evangelizing, one analyzes and classifies details, 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 and instead of opening the door to grace, not real grace, but just feel-good experiences, one exhausts his energies in inspecting and verifying details, details. That's when people ask for a blessing, an exhaustive moral analysis. Details, details, details should not be placed as a precondition for conferring it. So don't pay attention to the pastoral practice, the theory, the norms. Instead, focus on how complex their situation and life is. Don't judge people. 
All right, next we have rudimentariness. So just to review, rudimentariness is inchworming through the lower reason where conscience is trying to apply higher general principles down to individual situations. And if we can do that, then maybe we can create all these green down here pastoral solutions that only go case by case rather than paying attention to the light of the magisterium. All right, so we'll put that up there. But that's kind of blocking, so we'll hide it for a moment. Paragraph four, it's a matter of avoiding that something that's not marriage is being recognized as marriage. And you could say to me, okay, how is this inchworming? Well, um, this is inchworming in not the sinner's conscience, not the priest's conscience, but the whole church's conscience. The church should be paying attention to that blue stuff, to the teachings of precepts in general, to the magisterium in general. But now it's going to focus instead on just the narrow application of marriage. So um, we'll get into this way later in the later part of the video. So just shelve it for the moment until later. But yeah, this is actually is an instance of rudimentariness in the whole mind of the church. Next, rudimentariness in the priest. So paragraph 12. One must also avoid the risk of reducing the meaning of blessings to just formal liturgical blessings. For that would lead us to wrongly accept the same moral conditions for a simple blessing that are called for in the reception of those scary sacraments. Oh, what an intolerable burden that we should have to go after all these moral conditions. Such a risk, a risk, requires that we broaden this perspective further. Indeed, there's a danger that a pastoral gesture that's so beloved and widespread will be subjected to too many moral prerequisites, which under the, under the claim of control could overshadow the assumed to be an unconditional power of God's love in the priest's heart that forms the basis for this gesture of blessing. Okay, so here they're separating sacraments and liturgical rubrics and control from just gestures of blessing. So the priest shouldn't have to apply. He should just go out and bless. All right, next is the sinner's conscience, and this is the worst. So we'll go on to that next. Paragraph 13, Pope Francis urges not to lose pastoral charity and to avoid being judges who only exclude, deny, and reject. Um, reject what? Well, he didn't say, but we can infer inject, reject sinners. Reject sinners, particularly seared consciences, where they've just decided to not pay attention to their conscience. <laughs> so next, paragraph 26, the Pope's responses in 2023 invite discernment concerning the possibility of forms of blessing requested by one or more persons that, and here so that Francis can feign, pretend to be doctrinally vigilant, that do not convey an erroneous conception of marriage, just marriage, and yet so Francis can let every other sin run amok, yet, and yet in situations that are morally acceptable from an objective point of view, yet would account for the fact that pastoral charity requires us not to treat simply as sinners those whose gu objective guilt or responsibility might be attenuated by various factors affecting subjective imputability. Okay, so the lower paragraph here was about separating objective standards from subjective imputability where, yeah, they might actually get off if they didn't realize it was wrong or if they were, had too much passion. You know, those five standard five reducers of culpability. So yeah, he has a point here, but that's really rare. And most major issues like divorce and, you know, like gay couples, everybody knows that it's definitely imputable to the individual. They knew what the, the role and the law was. They just did it. So paragraph 26 here is not that important. Much more important is paragraph 13, where Pope Francis urges us to still exercise pastoral charity and just don't judge, you know, so that people can continue to inch along with their seared consciences, even if they're an open, intentional sinner. All right, let's keep going. Next is creativity. Where is that in Fiducia Supplicans? Well, to review... Okay, creativity is in the will up there. Remember that. And so we're going to over-focus on the will so that we don't have to focus on intellect and where principles and judgments and precepts are. 
All right, so pink. Conscience leads not so much to focus on norms as to a creative and responsible acceptance of tasks. And we'll not call the consciences acts judgments anymore. We'll just call them decisions because really we're not using our conscience. We're just deciding unconsciously. And that way we can attain moral maturity in those broad sunlit uplands where we're not restricted by norms and precepts. And elsewhere he writes, based on a more existential attitude and hermeneutic, we can justify a creative mindset so that we're not obliged by precepts, blue precepts. So pink, pink, pink. Paragraph 23 in Fiducia Supercons. When considered outside of a liturgical framework, oh no, um, these expressions of faith are found in a realm of greater spontaneity and freedom. Nevertheless, the optional nature of pious exercises should in no way be taken to imply and under disrespect of those pious exercises. The way forward requires a correct and wise, wise in the ways of this world, appreciation of the many riches of popular piety, the potentiality, oh, creativity, here we come, of these riches. In this way, blessings would become a pastoral resource to be valued rather than a risk or a problem, like liturgy is a risk or problem. <laughs> All right, moving on. Pastors should perform blessings spontaneously. Simple gestures that shouldn't become a liturgical or semi-liturgical act. Indeed, such ritualization would constitute a serious impoverishment because it would subject a gesture of great value and popular piety to excessive control, depriving ministers of freedom and spontaneity in their pastoral accompaniment of people's lives. In this regard, there should come to mind the Pope's words, decisions that may be part of pastoral prudence shouldn't be necessarily become the norm. For this reason, one should neither provide for nor promote a ritual for the blessings of couples in an irregular situation. At the same time, one shouldn't prevent or prohibit the church's closeness to people in every situation in which they might seek the church's help through a simple blessing. In a brief prayer, in a spontaneously given through the blessings, there's no intention to legitimize anything. It's all existential, unconscious. All right, we'll look at paragraph 30. Pastoral prudence and wisdom may suggest that the ordained should just join in the prayer of these sinners, who, although in a union that can't be compared in any way to marriage, because it's not moral, yet desire to entrust themselves to the Lord's mercy anyway. Because, <laughs> again, remember, they're going to set their own precepts and laws. Okay, so there we have major creativity in Fiducia Suplicans. Total emphasis, so you can hide in the realm of creativity and not focus on the objective precepts and laws of, t of the church and of God. All right, formal call. Okay, so now that we've covered situation ethics and found it in Fiducia Suplicans, now we can move more broadly to all the other problems in Fiducia Suplicans. First of all, theological censures. And this is going to constitute its formal cause. So this is like the problems with the encyclical itself. And first of all, the first theological censure is, of course, going to be situation ethics itself. That's going to be close to heresy, pernicious, which means everywhere, commonly used today, not safe and dangerous to morals. And then lastly, it's VDC, the verbal de contrary, against the word of God. Okay, so first off, situation ethics. They have this, these sacred cows. They want to defend complex ungodliness, creative, still creating itself ungodliness, and rudimentary baby step ungodliness. But against that, the truth is the preceding three slides and then Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against not just some, but all ungodliness and wickedness. Because situation ethicists agree that they hate the boogeymans of simple, finished, and broad ungodliness. They hate the Hitlers, the Maos, you know, everybody in the Republican Party. That's simple. But they want to safeguard all their childhood, childlike ungodliness. And that's what this whole document is about. Next, paragraphs 11 to 12, the fiducia says that the church only has no only has no power to confer its liturgical blessing on manifest sinners, when in reality it has no power to confer any blessing on manifest sinners. 
and it, the document mentions the possibility of blessing couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples. Okay, so this is captious, which means it's designed to ensnare you into sin. It's temerarious, which means rash. It's defacing of the beauteous splendor of the church. It's scandalous, which means it's causing people to sin, and it's dangerous in, in morals. Okay, so against this is 1 Corinthians 5 to 9, 13, and Jude 1, 12, against even associating with sinning Christians. Also, we've got a canon 1184 that manifest sinners didn't used to receive the peace of Catholic burial. And then we have numerous scriptures about giving when to give Christ's peace to people, and we'll cover that later, so don't pay much attention to it now. But then last of all, against this claim that um, we can bless sinners extra liturgically, we have Cardinal Ladaria's own response, which was the genesis and cause of this whole train, slow-moving train wreck in the first place, because he gave the correct answer. He said, no, the, it is illicit to give any form of blessing, not just liturgical blessing, but any form that tends to acknowledge the unions as such, like to, to notice that there's a couple there. In this case, such a blessing wouldn't be entrusting individual persons to the protection and help of God, but obviously would just be actually approving and encouraging a choice of a way of life that can't be recognized as objectively good. So here's the entire motive of the whole document that's on the chopping block. It's designed to ensnare. It's used all over today. It totally fills the church up with sinners, which destroys its beauty. And it leads to sin and is dangerous to those sinners' as morals. Next, paragraphs 34, 31 to 32, they have a, this monstrous self-contradiction. They claim, blessings don't claim to sanction or legitimize anything. <laughs> right after they said, blessings mean inclusion, solidarity, and peacemaking. You know, that's legitimacy. That's sanctioning. So this is rash. It's defacing of the splend beauty splendor of the church. And it's scandalizing, which means leading people to sin. Now, claiming that blessings don't sanction or legitimize anything is, of course, contradicted by the very definition of blessing, which benedicare means to speak well, to approve, says the dictionary. This is also all rejected by prudence, which tells us in the back of our minds that all these people coming for gay blessings aren't coming because they actually want some good purpose, but that they really just want endorsement uh, and a photo op of their sinful lifestyle being blessed by a priest so that they can flaunt it. This glaring and predictably exploitable fact was not covered in the document Fiducia Supplicans, except with a token and specious warning lest scandal should happen. Yet everyone knows that the political div dividends from the sensationalism of such headlines as Catholic Church appro approves blessing of gay couples or photo ops with a priest blessing to a gay couple were the precise reason, the whole raison d'etre for why the document was thought up in the first place. It was to please all those Germans up there. The document was and remains a giant act of mental reservation to use cunning artifice which is why he Pope had to bring in his master of art cunningness, which is Victor Manuel Fernandez, and in order to hide the truths from the world and even from Catholics, because this Pope is not about truth. He said, supposedly, um, I want the confusion. All right, next. Paragraph 38. Fiducius Supplicans claims, at the same time, one should not pre prevent or prohibit the Church's closeness to people in every situation in which they might seek God's help through a simple blessing. Yeah, this is pernicious. It's always done in all our pastoralness. It's scandalous because it leads people to think they're fine and it leads pastors also to sin. It's dangerous to morals to be close to sinners all the time. It's captious, designed to snare, and is against the word of God. And against this, we have the principle of moral cooperation with evil, which is part of the principle of the double effect. It's an application of the principle of double effect, which is a tried and true principle of Catholic morality, which says closeness to people in a situation constitutes a temptation to proximate cooperation with their sin. So the principle of double effect basically specifies when you are doing safe cooperation with evil, which is called immediate material cooperation. But if it's immediate, which means that you're close to them, then that's immoral. 
also not relevant here but also would be if you're actually telling them what to do to do evil that would be formal cooperation but that's not relevant here so you want all your cooperation with sinners to be media and material material where you didn't tell them what to do they they thought up to do evil and media where you actually weren't near to them you weren't powwowing them as they thought up their sin all right so Furthermore, scripture supports this over and over that don't be close with sinners. You keep company with adulterers, Psalm 50, 2 John 1. Whoever even greets someone who brings a different gospel shares their wicked work. Do not greet, bring him into the house. Do not share a meal with him. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of Christian, if he's guilty of immorality or greed, or if he's an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a robber, don't even eat with such a person. So, so much for closeness. And then we've got Jude one twelve. These proud homosexuals, if you read the rest of Jude 1, are blemishes upon your love feast as they boldly carouse together. Yeah. Next, paragraph 27. God always sees them as his children. That's proximate to heresy. It's pernicious. It's everywhere. It's scandalous, leading to sin. It's dangerous to morals, and it's against Scripture. John eight forty four. You belong to your father, the devil. And then there's the false belief in forever being a child of God, which lulls the soul into the complacent sleep of mortal sin. Paragraph 43. Therefore, even when a person's relationship with God is clouded by sin, he can always ask for a blessing. Okay, that's arrogant. That's rash and is against the word of God. Sirach 128. Do not disobey the fear of the Lord. Do not approach him with a divided mind. Oh, man. Next, paragraph 22. God who loves us unconditionally. Okay, well, now that does have a truthful meaning. Matthew 545. God makes his reign to fall on the good and bad alike. So what that means is that God's antecedent love is given to sinners and good people alike, his reign. But that doesn't matter for morality. For morality, we care about God's constant, his consequent love, which means after he thinks about whether or not we're a sinner or a good person. And so to just say God loves you unconditionally doesn't distinguish between whether it's antecedent or consequent. So that's ambiguous. And additionally, it's captious because it's designed to ensnare you, lull you into false complacency, and not worry about whether you need to think about conditions for receiving God's love. And then it's also scandalous, therefore, which means the same thing. And then it's against the word of God, because we have Malachi 1 denying that God always loves us. Sometimes he hates us as he hated Esau. And we have Romans, the whole letter of Romans, beginning with 118, that not the love of God is revealed from heaven, but the hatred of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. And then we've got John 14. If you love me, keep my commandments, thus demonstrating that God's consequent love is conditional. And then lastly, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just and will, and will forgive them and cleanse us. If shows that it's conditional. Next, paragraph 33. God never turns away anyone who approaches him. Well, that's contrary to the word of God, because against that we've got Genesis 4, 5. Cain offered, and but God had no regard for his offering. And Matthew 7, at the end of the world, Christ will say, Be gone from me, you evildoers. So he's certainly turning them away there. And then we have numerous verses, way too many to write here, about times when God hides his face from people. And anyone who has the slightest spiritual life would know that God, they often pray and get no response. So to say God never turns away anyone who approaches him shows that the writer of this document, Fiducius Sublocans, is just might be totally clueless and in a state of mortal sin because they don't have, apparently, the experience of really trying hard to get a response from God and getting no response, God turning them away. Next, 27. God will never stop blessing us. And then they give an example of even blessing us in prison. So this is against the word of God, and it can cause a false complacency with mortal sin, because Christ says of Judas, it would be better for that man if he'd never been born. Why? Because God will stop blessing us 
in hell for all practical purposes. Yeah, you, he may technically be blessing us by not destroying us and allowing us to still exist in hell, but who cares about that? It'll be so horrible that those blessings are insignificant. So next, paragraph 13, Pope Francis urged us to avoid being judges who only deny, reject, and exclude. So that's all about the old don't judge, you shouldn't judge, which we heard incessantly growing up ever since Vatican II. And that's captious. It's designed to ensnare. Well, because if you don't judge, then you're not going to judge yourself. You're going to not think about morality at all. You can just blissfully sin. It's also pernicious because it's used everywhere. It's scandalous. Sorry, wrong color. Scandalous because it does lead hordes of people to sin because judging was our stopgap, our defense, our hedge against going into sin. It used to be that like the women especially would cast these aspersions, these judgments, these silent treatments on people whenever they would misbehave in society. My mom, for instance, would at times not talk to a person in the church who she'd explain to them that she can't approve of their lifestyle. And this is great for guiding people to high standards. For Pope Francis, the Pope, the chief judge of all people, because judging is the function of a bishop, and he's the chief bishop. For the chief bishop, who's essential function is to judge because only bishops have that right then my goodness for him to say this is just such a massive disease on the church from the top down that the there this has to be the number one criterion in the selection of the next pope to find someone who will judge period and this is therefore dangerous to morals of course it's offensive to actually pious ears it's overturning of kingdoms, and it's subversive of hierarchy. Why? Well, because this is a cornerstone of neo-Marxisms, which is today expressed day in, today in the words of inclusion, which inclusion destroys governments. It destroys borders. It destroys the sane functioning of bureaus. And then it's also subversive of hierarchy, especially when it's used in the feminist movement. Feminists love to say, don't judge because it's men who are doing all the judging, whereas womankind wants to live in, in this blissful safe space of universal approval. And so in the blue here, I just want to stop and debunk this liberal myth that we shouldn't judge. Because when Jesus said, don't judge in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, etc., he wasn't talking to Christians. He was talking to potential converts, not yet Christians, Jews and pagans. And what he was doing was he was telling them don't judge me and my movement, because if you judge me and my movement, if you take offense at me, as Zechari the, Zechari the book of Zechariah says, then you won't come into the movement during the little window when the door is open. So don't judge you people who don't know whom you're dealing with in me and in my followers. Elsewhere, not the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus and St. Paul make it very clear that Christians are to judge. Judge rightly, says Jesus. And Paul says we should even judge people inside the church, not outside of it. I just read that verse a little earlier. 1 Corinthians 5 to the start of chapter 6 should be the cornerstone of any sane Christian functioning, sane Christian ethic of this current present age. You know, we need to be judging other Christians. And also we need to not be taking them to court. <laughs> All the judging should occur in the church, not outside the church. And so you see there in 6.3 that We'll even judge the angels someday. So, of course, we should excel in judging lesser things. Only don't judge a brother when the hated thing is a mere non-sinful annoyance, as James 4 says. Because in that case, you're judging the law inside that good brother. So, if someone's chewing loud, or if someone is misdressed, you know, don't judge that. <laughs> Next, paragraph 27. He is mother. He is mother. Okay, technically, there are Bible verses that talk about God's motherly concern for us. Oh, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under me. But really, we all know, in general, we say, Our Father who art in heaven. So this, right in the middle of a papical encyclical, is, sounds bad, malisonians, and it's against the word of God, kind of. 21. A request for a blessing should be received with gratitude. This is subversive of hierarchy. It's against the whole 
being in persona Christi. Someone who's in persona Christi would not receive a be request for a blessing with gratitude because Christ surely felt no gratitude when someone asks him for something supernatural because surely he gave blessings out of charity, deigning and stooping down to their level, not out of gratefulness to the thousands of people who were coming to him for help. I mean, that's just mathematically not conscious. Christ would have become psychologically unstable if he had to be grateful to all these people. But last of all, then, we find in the entry, the value of this document is that it offers a specific and innovative contribution to the pastoral meaning of blessings. I'm sorry, but that's new. To call something new in theology is an insult. So, so what all of this just showed you is that basically, the writers of Fiducia Supplicans don't no scripture. They don't know scripture. Therefore, they made all these theologically censurable errors. Therefore, they can't be theologians. Neither can they do a good job in ruling. Because if you don't know scripture, if you don't know the key spots in scripture that decide the major moral questions of the day, if you don't know, like, Revelation 2 is the best instruction book for how the church is to exist in reality in New Testament times after Christ's gone, then how are you going to rule the church? How are you going to know what to do with like sin and sinners? How are you going to know what pastoralness really is? So Pope Francis and Victor Manuel Fernandez are fundamentally actors. They're like imposters. I'm not going to say imposters because they're the legitimate rulers of the church, the Pope and the Bishop, but they're good for nothing. So the And this has got to be fundamental in the next picking of the next Pope. Whatever you do, you better find a Pope that understands how to judge and why to judge. Because that's the job of a bishop, particularly the Bishop of Bishops, the Pope in Rome. So moving on from there, we can shoot a few other awkward bullet holes in Fiducia Supplicans. First is, right in the intro, that it references the authoritative teaching of Pope Francis and his perennial doctrine, the Holy Father's free teaching. Elsewhere, they've spoken of the magisterium of Francis. But we just saw that Pope Francis or Manuel Fernandez don't know scripture, whoever which one wrote it, probably both of them. So they're not theologians, they don't know the Bible, and so it's pretty darn awkward for them to be self-referencing themselves. Furthermore, Pope Francis knows this, and that's why he has deliberately avoided, if you pay attention to him, he has deliberately avoided ever teaching anything authoritatively. That's why he has gone and run and pulled situation ethicists out of South America, because that's the ethic of the unworthy servant who forgives all the debts in the parable because he himself can no longer be Christ's servant. So that way, he'll hope to ingratiate himself with all the friends whom he lets into the church, all the sinners, hoping that after he's thrown out of the stewardship, maybe he'll be able to live with them. Problem is, they'll be living in hell, because the keys of Peter are free in general, and though they can free individuals, yet I don't think God, in judging these people, is going to buy the excuse that, well, Pope Francis said that anything goes, as long as I'm immersed in complexity and I'm trying to be creative and I'm sticking bit by bit to conscience decision after conscience decision like a child. So this is like a real embarrassment. Next, they're right there in paragraph four, um, they had a glaring typo. Pope Francis' recent response to the second of the five questions posed by two cardinals. And again, you see down low in the footnote below that, Respuestas a los dubia proposed por los dos cardinales by the two cardinals. And they give the date 11th of July, 2023. And yeah, that's the correct um, dubia. There have been several, and that's the right one. But that one was given by five cardinals. And if you read the Vatican's version of it online, you'll see why they made a mistake and said two cardinals. Because three cardinals are like awkwardly put on the left margin. And so you might not notice them. So whoever was writing Fiducia Supercarns probably just saw two. The other possibility is that it was a typo in the original Spanish, where the original Spanish was supposed to say Los Cardinales, the Cardinals. Someone accidentally wrote Dos Cardinales, two Cardinals. But okay. Lastly, paragraph 31 to 32. This is the heart and core. Oh my goodness. Sheer fantasy. 
um, that we should accept them, gays, coming for a blessing, only if destitute, begging, acknowledging themselves humbly as sinners, and desiring to mature and grow in fidelity to the gospel. Okay, we'll get into this later in this video, uh, hammer this later, but this is basically a cringeworthy fantasy legend farce sarcasm. It's really, what it really is, is a snub that, read between the lines here, Fernandez is saying, all right, you conservatives, you win. Go ahead and be a stickler to those gays coming to you and make sh rub their f noses in their bad deeds and make them feel destitute and begging and humbly acknowledging themselves as sinners. Okay, now it's of course cloaked in all this nice talk, but that's what he's really doing because this paragraph hits you like a bolt from the blue. Where did that come from? I've been being told through three quarters of this document that we were about to bless sinners and we get here and you say, You're, we can only bless them if we humiliate them? Oh my goodness. So the truth is that no gay couple would ever come simultaneously, my goodness, for a blessing to help them mature and grow in fidelity to the gospel by ceasing all gay sexual behavior. <laughs> like either one would come individually first, in which case the issue of couples is irrelevant, or they'd wish to continue their relationship and their sexual activity. E far less likely is that they'd come mutually, both of them destitute and begging. This is like unreal. This is a farce. This is cringeworthy legend sarcasm. And we'll heavily hit this later in the video, so don't worry about it so much now. But what it really is, is a snub where Fernandez is finally having to admit the truth that the conservatives were right. They can't be blessed but he's gonna snub us and say, okay, conservatives, you win, have it your way. Go ahead and be a stickler, like rub their noses in the dirt and humiliate them. See how that works for you. Because this paragraph hits you like a bolt from the blue. And it's like, where did that come from? Lastly, a major criticism is in the only in the English version. It says in the key paragraph, the key word of the key paragraph, that the blessing may be departed. And that's, we'll hit this heavily in the end of the video because that leaves the door wide open to everyone else who would like to do a blessing. Maybe not in the same way because we may do it that way, but that means we don't have to do it that way. We could do it in some other way. So we don't have to use all that destitute begging and humble acknowledgement of sinful in this language that you're about to talk about. No, we can create, as James Martin did immediately, his own form of blessing of a gay couple. But if you read the other languages, that's not in those languages. Every last one of them says in green here that in such cases, a blessing is imparted to one who is destitute, begging, acknowledging themselves humbly as sinners, etc., etc. So the truth is that this encyclical has been aimed particularly at English-speaking liberals who will now be able to say and say, oh, then this is just an unobligatory example, which means that we can do a different sort of gay blessing. Creative liturgy, here we come. But yeah, this is a serious, serious mistranslation. And we used to have all kinds of English mistranslations like this by ISIL, I-C-E-L, and, but here it is occurring again. So we need to find out who mistranslated this word. Was it someone in Rome? Was it someone in the USCCB? Who did it? And so investigative journalists, get on it. Okay, you've made it to the most important part of this video, the final cause, the goal, purpose, and intent of fiducia supplicans. So in final cause causology, we always want to plan things backwards. This is called reverse planning. And so we want to look at the trail of steps that led to fiducia supplicans and analyze them as they went. And it will also help you keep them straight in your mind. So first, originally we had a question, does the church have the power to give the blessing to unions of persons of the same sex? And the Congregation of the, for the Doctrine of the Faith, led by Cardinal Ladaria, responded in 2021, no. And we read it. In that case, the blessing would manifest not the intention to entrust these people to God's protection, but to approve and encourage their choice and way of life that can't be objectively ordered to God. Okay? But what was meanwhile going on was that in Germany, blessings were occurring. 
So that was rather awkward. So what was the Pope's response? Blam. He blew up the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, renamed it to the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, and sacked Cardinal Ladaria for giving the correct response. So simultaneously, five conservative cardinals asked their five dubia. So that was in 2023. And they, trying to knock out the German blessings, asked, based on Genesis 1, speaking of sexual complementarity, reinforced by Romans 1, can the church deviate from Veritatis Splendor's moral doctrine and accept as possible goods sinful situations? And this was, oh, way too juicy for Francis and Fernandez. What a great occasion to hardwire and formalize the reversal of Ladaria's response. But they didn't quite know how to do it yet. So initially, in preliminarily, they responded, maybe. Um, pastoral prudence must adequately discern whether there are forms of blessing that could be given to gay couples. And they used as their linchpin whether or not it conveys an erroneous conception of marriage. And we will destroy and hammer that in the coming slides. But the result of that was, of course, that in Fiducia Supplicans, we'll answer, yes, there are forms of blessing where we can bless gay couples. So the no of Cardinal Ladaria got transformed into a yes of Cardinal Fernandez. And of course, we know that that yes was an extremely qualified technically um they have to humiliate themselves and confess themselves sinners but at least francis got his official yes answer that he wanted all right then working backward then we can see that i have not one but two straw men up here fiducia Sublican straw man which we'll study but we can see that that straw man was already there in Francis's 2023 response to the five cardinals. And that straw man, of course, is the claim to defend the marriage from erroneous conceptions, which we're about to destroy. All right, so that was a giant straw man or pretext to want to defend marriage from erroneous conceptions. Why? Because the entire document of Ferducci Struplicans was to respond to those five cardinals as five dubia, particularly dubia number two, where in response E, Francis and Fernandez said what we just read, that pastoral prudence must dis discern whether there are responses that wouldn't convey an erroneous conception of marriage. But that's a straw man. Why? Because in red, the mere reputation of marriage is nothing compared to the reputation, honor, dignity, and authenticity of the peace of Christ, which is a prerequisite for any blessing whatsoever, and being supernatural should only be given to those in Christ, in the mystical body of Christ, in a state of grace, in the Holy Spirit, and which would therefore be violated by, in Fiducia Supplicans' words, a blessing affecting inclusion, solidarity, and peacemaking with those in mortal sin. And we need to stop and hammer this home ad nauseum because scripture hammers it home ad nauseum. That peace, the peace of Christ, should only be given to people in the Holy Spirit, in Christ, in sanctifying grace. And the background basis for this you see here is Matthew 16 and John 20. Whomever you forgive, I also forgive. This is the keys of Peter. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. But it's also said to all the apostles, and also briefly to the, all the Christians. So forgiveness is the basis for peace. Next, in order to better understand what this peace is, we should consider its opposite, enmity. Enmity with men? No. Enmity with God. James 4, harlots, don't you know that friendship with the world, Francis, is enmity with God? Ephesians 2, for Christ to make in himself of the two one new man, thus making peace so that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So it's not just enmity with God, but it's also enmity with your neighbor secondarily, just like there are two great commandments, love God and love neighbor. So next, Jeremiah 6. They say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. So, all right. Next, this peace is supposed to be supernatural. John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Philippians 4. 
and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then we get into the verses which explicitly say that this is not peace with men, but this is peace with God. You know, like others might rename this righteousness, justification, justice, being in right relationship with God. So the first thing we need to start off with, of course, is the scads, the numbers of verses through every single epistle of St. Paul, except Hebrews, and two of the writings of St. John, the evangelist, begin with this essential fundamental greeting, grace to you and peace from, from me, from man, from the church, no, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, therefore, being justified by faith, we have happiness, no, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, which is above, the peace which surpasses all understanding. The Which peace? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Romans 8, for being carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know, this is the great reward of Christians. It's not that you get anything, it's that you have peace. Peace of conscience. Peace. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Galatians 6. And as many as walk according to this rule of being a new creation, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So it's not on all of you, but it's just those who walk according to the rule. Colossians 1. And having made peace with God through the blood of his cross, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. 1 Peter 5. Peace to all you. Period? No. Peace to all you who are in Christ Jesus. So he might be writing to some people there who aren't in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 3. Strive, immaculate and inviolate, with him to be found at peace. Romans 3. And then last of all, we see that this peace becomes identifiable with Christianity itself. In Romans 3, in Isaiah, quoting Isaiah 59, the way of peace they have known not. Because that phrase, the way, is the original name for Christianity, as we see in all these verses and acts. And then the gospel of peace in Romans 10 and Ephesians 6. It's not just any gospel. It's, not, it's the good news. The good news of what? The good news of... Um, happiness of receiving stuff, of going to heaven? No. The good news of we have finally found the peace. Not with men, but with God by forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, consequently, to merely find that such a blessing doesn't convey an erroneous conception of marriage is meaningless. And any blessing arising from that pretense of conscientiousness over not giving an erroneous conception of marriage is just as evil as the Pharisees tithing mint and dill and cumin, and thus thinking that thereby they are righteous. Whereas, to the contrary, Christ warns them that they have forgotten the weightier matters, justice and faithfulness. For justice is something more than mint and dill and cumin, and peace is something more than not conveying an erroneous conception of marriage. All right, so now that we have hammered that home, we can move on and examine in greater detail exactly what Cardinal Fernandez was doing. All right, so now let's go right back and find exactly where was the disconnect. Okay, so in paragraph four of Fiducci Subulcans, he said, it's a matter of avoiding that something that's not marriage is being recognized as marriage, and he cited five, footnote five, referenced the response to the dubia proposed by the two, really five cardinals from 2023. So... That dubia, as we already looked at, is the one where the five cardinals cited Genesis 1, mentioning male and female complementarity, and then moved on to Romans 1, pointing out that denying this complementarity, the sexual difference, is a consequence of denying the creator. And then they asked, can the church derogate from this principle, considering it as a mere ideal, in contrast to what was taught in Veritatis Splendor 103, and except as a possible good in orange here. This is key. Except, can they, we accept as a possible good? Can we accept as good objectively sinful situations, such as unions with persons of the same sex, without committing heresy? 
And notice, in the way they have worded this question, they are implicating both the transgender and the gay homosexual movements. Transgender in Genesis 1, they deny, formally deny, Genesis 1 revealing a difference between men and women. Because the transgender movement says, oh, well, there's biological sex, but now we're creating this whole brand new category called gender as different from sex. And in gender, you can be whatever you want to be. And so they made up 104 separate genders. So that's formal denial of this revealed truth, Genesis 1. That's heresy. But then they also cunningly brought in the homosexual movement through Romans 1, where which does mention that because they didn't w worship the creator as the creator, therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, and they slipped into homosexuality, if you read it. So Pope Francis took this excellent question, saying, are we going to go with transgender and LGBTQ, treating them as possible goods? And he responded by changing the subject, as you see in green here. The church has a very clear understanding of what? Goodness? No, marriage. The question was about accepting as a good, but no, he's going to respond to it's an issue of marriage. Here's what marriage is. Um, other forms of union are only partial and analogous. B, and then here in C is the key response. For this reason, the church avoids any type of rite or sacramental, and blessings are sacramentals, that might contradict this contra conviction and imply that something that is not marriage is being recognized as marriage. So here in C, he feels like he has settled the question. It's about marriage. And so he then he just seamlessly segues into this next response, which suddenly is now all practical. He is left behind the speculative. It's settled. Now we're going to go to practical implementation. Nevertheless, in our dealings with people, we, we must not lose pastoral charity. See, he's moved on to the question of what do we do about it? We should permeate all our decisions and attitudes, kindness, patience, understanding, encouragement. We cannot become judges who only deny, reject, and exclude. For this reason, pastoral prudence must adequately discern whether there are forms of blessing which don't convey an erroneous conception of, oh yes, marriage. Um, for when one asks a blessing, blah, 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 blah. So you see what happened there. We asked about whether it can be good at all. And he said, hmm, I, 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 I might think of something that's not against marriage. He responded, it's about marriage, not giving a false understanding of marriage, marriage violation, and about how to do it pastorally. So going back then, he was wrong when he said it's a matter of avoiding that something is not marriage is being recognized as marriage. No, because we asked about Genesis 1, which makes it a human nature matter, not a marriage matter. Particularly, it's not a matter of marriage violation, but goodness violation, Holy Spirit violation. Can we accept as good? You know, the Holy Spirit is goodness. Additionally, it's conscience violation. It's a matter of conscience violation. Can a priest just depart from revealed doctrine and then lie? Sure, I'll bless your sin. Right? How? By accepting objectively sinful situations as good at all. Which, and all of this would of course have to be done before blessing any sinful lifestyle. You have to check off all these boxes. In response, fiducia supplicans, after saying it's about marriage, it's about marriage, it's a marriage, then surprise, surprise, it will pivot and qualify, hmm, well, accept them for a blessing only if destitute, begging, acknowledging self humbly as sinners and desiring to mature and grow in fidelity to the gospel. That's orthodox. Yeah. But the way in which it was said, how it was put after this giant lead up, telling us all that it's about marriage and then rapidly changed to the subject, totally unjustified and unsupported by the prior three quarters of the document, means that this is something far worse. So what is this doing? This is disarming all the objections that those cardinals were giving. Because if you do that, then yeah, you don't have to accept objectively sinful situations as good at all. So that one's gone. 
And you don't have to lie and violate your conscience. That's gone. And you don't have to violate the Holy Spirit in your heart and your understanding of the goodness of God. That's gone, which of course means that all of those checkboxes are gone too. So it seems fine, right? But the way in which Fernandez inserted this here, right out of the blue, at the end of the encyclical, as a total switcheroo, totally unjustified by the prior three quarters of the encyclical that gave us every single impression that he was about to give a rich blessing of the homosexuals in their homosexual sexual lifestyle, shows that what this really is, read between the lines, this really is a snub. He's saying, fine, conservatives, you win. Okay, I'll be technically orthodox. Be a stickler. See how that works for you. Ha 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 ha. Why? Now it gets subtle. Because it doesn't matter that I let you win the orthodoxy argument. Because I've let the cat out of the bag. Here's the cat. See this here? Because I didn't shoot down this issue of yours. It is a matter of avoiding that something is not marriage is being recognized as marriage. That assertion of mine still stands, and I'm going to use that to let every last liberal blessing gay couples off the hook and the cats out of the bag. So then to summarize, the entire Fiducia Supercon's document was supposedly to defend marriage and to advise how to be pastoral without counterfeiting marriage, but we never cared about marriage at all in the first place. Rather, we cared about our own good, our consciences, and gays is good, their entire lifestyle, and the church is good of not appearing to depart from revealed doctrine, and the document's logic hasn't allayed any of our fears and hasn't told us anything about how to be pastoral without counterfeiting these three goods. So our standard is far higher, far more difficult to safeguard than Fiducia Suplicans' standard, which was a straw man, a pretext. So yeah. That was wrong, and it's a matter of avoiding that something that's not, that's not good is being recognized as good. And in particular here, we can even say the common good of everyone, not just of marriage, but the common good, which is a much richer co concept, which is the flourishing of every individual and, and of every grouping of individuals up right up to the flourishing of the entire whole. That's what we were asking about. So... The pivot, then, will then be used, though, as a clever separator, a clever filter to filter out the conservatives from the liberals. Because notice here, paragraph 4 versus paragraph 31 to 32. 31 to 32 is what he will want all the conservatives to focus on. 4, the claim of marriage defense, is what he'll want the liberals to focus on. So all the Pope explainers like Lofton will happily go right up to paragraph 3132 and say, oh, look, see here, it's perfectly orthodox. You don't need to worry about this document. And they'll hope that the smart orthodox people will follow suit blindly, stupidly. And But meanwhile, the liberals will look at paragraph 4 and say, oh, wait, but no, no, it's all about marriage. It's about safeguarding marriage. As long as we safeguard marriage, we don't have to follow the example given in paragraph 31 to 32, which we all saw was so humiliating and demeaning. And this is especially lethal danger in the English version of the encyclical, because rewind the tape to the other criticisms. The last one, you'll see that there is a key typo in the English where it says that all this blessing of homosexuals in paragraph 31 to 32, where they give an example of them being destitute, begging, and humbly confessing themselves as sinners, all that is that what may be done. So that implies that you don't have to do it that way. So that even further supports the liberals in sticking with paragraph four to just find their own method of safeguarding marriage and not giving a false counterfeit impression of marriage. And then, okay, so the encyclical will actually draw them in a little further and further require these liberals to at, uh, to at least abide by a few scandal preventers and they'll say, okay, well, no liturgy, no official procedures or rituals for blessing gays. But, hey, we have established by this encyclical one thing. And this, listen, is the goal of the entire encyclical. Just to get the statement established that it is possible to bless gay couples. Just the claim. 
Everybody in the world won't bother the details like we could do. But that's the only purpose. Why? Because there is a dialectic at work. Because the liberals will plan someday to reverse course and go right back up to not having to abide by those scandal preventers and someday have a liturgy and official procedures and rules. That's the way you fry the egg in the pan slowly. As Timothy Gordon perfectly demonstrated over and over in his many videos, that the way these people work is lying as can be. Because like Cardinal Casper said, oh, I'm out of favor. Rome isn't going in my liberal direction even as they've actually, yes, were. But the reason they had him say that was so that everybody would let their guard down and think, whoo, dodged the bullet. But you go look at the timeline. Yes, at that moment, yes, they were, in fact, planning all these liberal initiatives like Fiducia Supplicans and like the Synod on Synodality. So they will lie that they're not taking a step while they're planning that step so that then later they can take that step completely unexpectedly. This is a classic Hegelian dialectic where you advance the dialectic a little more and a little more and a little more. And the true socialists are those who don't get hung up and die on any one of the stepstones of the dialectic, but they're the ones who understand that the goal is the whole process and to just keep on going more and more and more liberal forever and ever ad infinitum until we arrive at the great dawn of socialism or communism, depending what flavor of Hegelian socialist you are. And if you want to know more about this, go look at my website, diversityfoolbox.com, or the guy whom I studied from, the genius Dr. James Lindsay, who studies neo-Marxism today and snuck seven pa fake papers in the Grievance Studies Affair into the top journals in gender and racial sexuality studies, things like that. All right, so that's the, what's going on. That's what's really going on in this encyclical. It is a clever filter, a clever dipole, a bar magnet to suck the conservatives to the conservative end and keep them all happy with their orthodox sounding formula in paragraph 31 to 32 and suck the liberals to the other end to let them go on blessing in Germany, led by their leader, Archbishop Georg Betzing here. So another way to show it is like this. The conservatives get the practical implementation where they get this cringeworthy, fantasy, legendary, farcical, sarcastic example of how, yeah, you can bless gays, but only if they come to you destitute, begging, and humbly confessing themselves sinners. And meanwhile, the liberals get the speculative victory that it's really just about defending marriage, which of course is a lie, but they get that. Well, the conservatives will draw from that their speculative conclusion, aha, technically we're right, right? And the liberals, huh, what would you do here if you were a liberal? You want to stick to the principle that it's just about defending marriage, but you don't like this cringeworthy, fantasy, legendary, farcical, satir sarcastic example of how to shame a homosexual couple. Well, you'll just make develop your own blessing. So the liberals have open season on creative liturgy. Of course, they can't make a formal liturgy yet. And this is all such a farce and a legend and sarcasm because what the paragraph 31 is saying is couples will just grovel up to you and say, we detest ourselves as a couple, so please bless us in detesting ourselves so that perhaps we may come to no longer be a couple and thus detest ourselves less. Like, is this something that anybody is ever going to say? I doubt that there is one single couple that will ever be at that point in their walk towards Christ who is going to say it and phrase it that way and come as a couple. Nobody is going to do either of these things. Why? Because there's two problems with it. First, if their goal was to consider not being a couple, then they wouldn't come as a couple to consider not being a couple, but they'd show up at the office as an individual saying, hmm, I'm having second thoughts about my relationship. Second, if they really detested themselves and confessed to themselves sinners and were begging for help to go to heaven, then they'd focus on that and wouldn't be even asking for a blessing in the first place for two sub-reasons. First, because they'd be focusing so much on their problems that they wouldn't ask for good stuff. The document gave an example of blessing the other things in their lives which are good. Well, they wouldn't be concerned about that. They'd be concerned about the serious problems that might get them hell. 
And secondly, because out of just sheer depression, out of needing to come to Father, they probably wouldn't be asking for a blessing at all. So this is just a fantasy farce, you know? Yeah, technically we're right, but we thought we were defending the Rock of Gibraltar, and we're really just defending this coral reef in the middle of the Pacific that's going to disappear in two hours when the tide comes in. A parable. Okay, blessings here are like square wheels. Conservatives say wheels need to be round to go. So the liberal square wheel manufacturer in the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith said, so onto the scene comes the liberal square wheel manufacturer, Victor Manuel Fernandez. And the conservatives say, that won't work. And he responds, well, to be a wheel, it's just a matter of being connected to an axle, right? Right? That's what makes a wheel, right? Bingo! He gives his example. Do you like our idea? It doesn't claim to work. It's just art to illustrate what a vehicle would be like if it had square wheels and felt sad because it wished its wheels were round. See? It would need this kind of bizarre road to actually work. <laughs> so, technically, yeah, in the most extreme, weirdest situation, it might work. <laughs> Not in reality. So the conservatives, fools, fall for the bait. Okay, all right, we say. Unusual idea, but in that context, yeah, we could theoretically like it enough to bless it. All right. Technically, you win in this weird minor situation. And then he'll respond, respond to his liberal friends in paragraph four. Hey, guys, did you hear that? Conservatives finally support square wheels. Square wheels. Some notified Germany, square wheels. Start the manufacturing. And all the square wheels come pouring out. And conservatives are meanwhile like, hmm, are you going to build special bumpy roads for all those square wheels? And Victor Manuel Fernandez is just like, nope, we just wanted to get your blessing. We'll use them on flat ground. It'll just be bump, 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 bump. But we don't care about that. So, and, and oh yeah, don't be a hater. So, we need to remember, the church needs to remember, Behold, I am sending you as sheep among wolves, so be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Prudence tells us that many li living in a state of sin, sin seek blessings precisely to garner endorsement of their sinful lifestyle, and so we should resist that and not give it to them, lest they flaunt it. This glaring and predictably exploitable fact was absolutely not covered in the document Fiducius Subocans at all, except with a token specious warning lest scandal should happen in paragraph 30. Yet everyone knows that the political dividends from the sensationalism of headlines saying Catholic Church approves blessings of gay couples and all these personal photos on Facebook of Mark and Joe getting blessed were the precise reason, the whole raison d'etre for why the document was thought up in the first place, because it lets the dialectic keep on moving, and as we all learn from all the spirits of Vatican II that ever emerged, they will eventually bring about the speculative change later, as long as they can get practical implementation happening. The document was, therefore, and remains a giant act of mental reservation, that means hiding the truth. To use cunning artifice to hide the truth from the world and even from Catholics. Which truths? One, that mortal sinners cannot be blessed. Two, that mortally sinning couples cannot be blessed as couples. Three, that the church does not and cannot evolve as Hegelian dialectics would wish it to evolve and is therefore not on any Hegelian dialectical trajectory to meet up eventually someday with the simultaneously self-transforming advance of the rest of the socialist communist world, particularly in Davos, Switzerland. Because that's the goal, that's the hope of all the World Economic Forum neo-Marxists that as the rest of the world advances in its dialectical step, step, step towards the great dawn of sudden world neo-Marxism, the Catholic Church will too, so that we all arrive at that point at the same moment. Four, 
to hide the truth that Cardinal Ladaria, the innocent victim, was indeed sacked and the congregation renamed a dicastery precisely because in his 2021 response, he correctly and publicly acknowledged without any Francis-esque duplicity, cunning, or artifice, the truth that no gay couples cannot be blessed. Period. And so the church is left with egg on her face and there's defacing of the beauteous splendor of the church just so that Pope Francis can get his assertion that yes, under extreme abusive circumstances, you can bless a gay couple. Wouldn't it have been simpler to just say no? To just let Cardinal Ladaria say no? Then all us conservatives wouldn't be having to go to bed every night with our minds spinning in rage and outrage and controversy and losing sleep and not doing the other things in our lives that we would like to do. Like, I have no life. I was going to do all this evangelism at JMU this whole semester, but I can't do it because Fiducia Suplicans came out. Do you know how many people could have maybe been brought to the faith if it weren't for Pope Francis? So this is burdening every last member of the mystical body of Christ because little Pope Francis wants to please his Davos friends. That's what's going on here. So he sucked his skillful diplomat out of Argentina, Fernandez, to do it for him in true condemned situation ethics artifice style. And I know for a fact that that was the deliberate premeditated intent of Francis because I can see it in the material cause, which is the basis, the foundation, the building blocks out of which nearly all of Pope Francis's encyclicals through Cardinal Fernandez have emerged. And that is that this encyclical fits right into the pattern of encyclicals which want to bring unholy sinners into the church, or at least secular activists into the church. So Laudato Si wanted to bring in secularism. Amoris Laetitia wanted to bring in divorced and remarried and mortal sin into the church. Fratelli Tutti wanted to bring in the Masonic Socialist Brotherhood of Men, that's secularism, into the church in a massive big way. The Synod on Synodality wanted to bring all the Jesuit literati and the Germans and the women the feminists into the church. All those are false gospels. Fiducia Suplicans, of course, wants to bring the gay couples, which is mortal sin, into the church. And the word is upcoming. Next is going to be some publication, which is going to bring about the false gospel of feminism into the church implemented through women deacons. So we know exactly what the track record and agenda is. And Pope Francis is not some middle-of-the-road guy. He's not some bumbling ignoramus. No, he is a deliberate friend of the world, which is enmity with God trying to bring neighbors in as brothers, as his Fratelli Tutti said. And if we could just take a step back to an even more basic level of causality, we should think about the nature of the theological thought of our recent popes. John Paul II was cuttingly insightful phenomenological analysis. Hence we got love and responsibility, concluding that no, you can't have contraception. Benedict XVI was the rich wine of sublime ancient liturgy and all the folds of depth and meaning that it has. Francis I is poorly disguised UN initiatives, and by this I mean the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, which are all about world, 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 secular, secular, this world, this world, make heaven on earth, utopianism. So, Ever since Vatican II, they've been talking about a hermeneutic of continuity, trying to argue that Vatican II was in continuity with everything before Vatican II. And that's all we heard from John, during the time of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Continuity, continuity, continuity. Is Pope Francis in continuity with the guys before him? I don't think so. Why? Well, because his pontifications are filled with lacunae, as we saw in all the theological and other criticisms of this document. Next, because he telegraphs all throughout it who he actually is. Pay attention to the word choice, the vocabulary, equitable, inclusive, 
governance, colonization, structural, structures, transformative, our common home, the God of history. I would recognize these in a second. Why? Because I made a website to catalog them all. Not in Francis, but in neo-Marxist thought, in Paulo Freire, in all the recent gender and sexuality studies, Gail Rubin, and Herbert Marcuse, and the serial abuser Michel Foucault. And you can go read my website, which cites the genius Dr. James Lindsay and his New Discourses website. Every academic of any sort nowadays needs to read this because it is literally in every walk of life from government to schools to religion to corporate America to media you name it it's there so when Pope Francis uses all this neo-Marxist jargon then he is telegraphing exactly who he is what his theological thought is it's nothing more than sociology additionally this thought is characterized by citations of the patrimony of the fathers, of scripture, no, of himself. Why? Because Francis is a PR idolizer. He's not a theologian or Bible reader. He doesn't know what's in the Bible. He doesn't know the sections, obviously, and the key parts that define Catholicism. And therefore, he repeatedly guts the curia with complete callous disregard for the skills of all these people. And whom does he replace them with? Why, he replaces them sometimes with UN NGO bureaucrats, people who aren't in religion at all, just because he wants to richen up the conversation, but he's actually just sterilizing the conversation. Because his ultimate goal, like the rest of the world on the dialectical trajectory toward one world government socialism, is to subordinate theology to sociology. Right? Right. So this is the theological thought of theology shackled, under duress, in slavery. Small wonder, then, that the African bishops universally reject fiducia suplicans, and how do they characterize it? As cultural colonization. And now, this word colonization is them playing the neo-Marxist card right back upon them, because that's almost always been used against conservatives. And here, they're playing that word right back against liberals, against Western imperialism. And yeah, this is another gospel. This is liberal, modernist, one-world government, eco-neo-Marxist, Hegelian socialism sitting on the throne of Peter implemented by the chief inquisitor of the dicastery of, for the doctrine of the faith. Therefore, in efficient cause, we're going to decide how did this encyclical come about and was it particularly an implementation of authentic magisterium or not? Because magisterium is technically an efficient cause. It is not a formal cause that some documents constitute magisterium, nor is it a material cause, just this category, that when I say I declare and define, suddenly it's magisterium. No, magisterium is an efficient cause. It is an act. It is something that's done. It is magisterium when you are magisterium, which is the Latin word for teaching. So is this authentic teaching is the same question. And Michael Lofton claims that fiducia supplicans is indeed authentic magisterium and that we are supposedly desperate to find some problem with it. He claims it's authentic magisterium. He claims it's paragraph three magisterium. I'll tell you in a second what that means. And that is therefore requiring religious, which means interior, submission of will and intellect to fiducia suplicans. To understand which, let's go to the levels of magisterium. And this is how I divide the four paragraphs of it up. I'm going to go to the same document he cites, The Profession of Faith, of Cardinal Ratzinger, also a year later in the document Donum Veritatis on the vocation of a theologian. All right, so there's four paragraphs to it, and you're going to see that paragraph one and two is infallible acts of teaching, and three and four aren't. And then on the other way, paragraphs one and three concern higher reason, which means dogmas, doctrines, whereas paragraphs two and four mostly concern individual facts. So lower reason. And in way of passing, I'm just going to let you know that in paragraph two, there's these four categories of Catholic truths. 
and A, B, and C are infallible, and decanonizations may or may not be infallible, probably are not infallible, judging from the signs that we saw at the time of Pope John Paul II's canonization. All right, but most Catholic truths are theological conclusions, a conclusion developed, drawn from two premises, one a truth of revelation, another a truth of natural reason, or dogmatic facts, such as that a particular pope or council was legit, or truths of reason, which are just like um, basic philosophy truths. Okay, so the church has to be able to teach these infallibly in order to teach the paragraph one dogmas infallibly. So it's kind of like the building blocks have to be infallible because the roof is infallible. So again, defeated dogmas and doctrinal teachings concern higher principles. Paragraphs two and four concern lower facts. So this is the speculative mindset or the practical mindset. All right, so here let's actually read the paragraphs. Um, anything in square brackets that is put in by me and is not in the actual text. Paragraph one, when the magisterium of the church makes an infallible pronouncement, and this is what we call extraordinary magisterium, and solemnly declares a teaching is found in revelation, the kind of assent that's called for is theological faith. That's the strongest faith you could possibly have. We would doubt science before we would doubt theological faith. This kind of adherence is to be given even to the teaching of the ordinary and universal magisterium when it proposes for belief a teaching of faith is divinely revealed. And the ordinary universal magisterium is just all the general ordinary teaching of bishops throughout the whole world in their administrations of their dioceses or in a formal council. Um, councils are not extraordinary magisterium, they're just ordinary magisterium. Same with synods. So there we saw an act of teaching as a faith confessor, where Peter is confessing the faith of these defeated dogmas. Now, next in paragraph two, we're going to see Peter as a fact confessor of these so-called probably infallible Catholic truths. And let's read it. When the magisterium proposes in a definitive way truths concerning faith and morals, which even if not divinely revealed are nevertheless strictly and intimately connected with the revelation, these two must be firmly accepted and held. Yeah, you should firmly hold these things because they're so connect close to dogmas. And so they're probably infallible. N none of all that's important for fiducia subricans. But now, in the two yellow parts here, we're going to get something that might concern fiducia subricans. So, paragraph three. This is where Peter or the bishops act as a faith guide. When the magisterium, not intending to act definitively, nevertheless teaches a doctrine to aid faith. Teaching a doctrine to aid a better understanding of revelation, and that's faith, and make explicit its content, that's faith, or to recall how some teaching is in conformity with the truths of the faith. That, maybe, is what Fiducius Suplicans is trying to do. It is trying to recall how blessing homosexual couples is in conformity with the truths of the faith. Maybe. Michael Lofton will argue this. Or, finally, to guard against ideas that are incompatible with these truths. The response called for in all these cases is that of religious submission of will and intellect. Why? Because Peter or the bishops have taught us a doctrine. They might not have done it infallibly, but it's a legit doctrine that convinces them. So we, the little people who don't know, should give religious submission of will and intellect and just go with it. And we should go with it completely in our hearts and minds, because this kind of response cannot be simply exterior, formalistic, or disciplinary, but must be understood within the logic of faith and under the impulse of obedience to the faith, not obedience to the teacher, not to the bishop, to the pope, but under the impulse of obedience to the faith within the logic of the faith. And I am going to argue here and now that fiducia supplicans is not this paragraph because of that last line of purple that you see there. Because... Fiducia Suplicans has no logic. I showed you how the first three quarters are totally different from the last quarter. How it hits you like a bolt from the blue where you've been expecting the whole time that they're going to give this rich blessing of gay couples in their gay lifestyle. And suddenly they say, oh yeah, you can bless them in this extremely rare farcical case where you humiliate them to disgrace in paragraph 31. So, there was no logic in that. And if there's no logic, then we need have no impulse of obedience to that logic or to any faith in it. 
because the whole encyclical sprang not from faith, not from people who even know the Bible or are theologians, but from sociologists and a chemist sitting on the throne of Peter. Paragraph 4. This is when Peter engages and teaches as an academic fact finder. Finally, in order to serve the people of God as well as possible, you know, pretty well, in particular by warning them of mm, dangerous opinions which are in the literature and in the papers and which could lead to error, the magisterium can intervene in questions under discussion which involve, in addition to solid principles, certain contingent and conjectural elements. It often only becomes possible later to know what was contingent or what was necessary. This is definitely where fiducia subicans is at all, if it is even an act of magisterium at all. Why? Because when the African bishop said, we will not implement fiducia subicans, Victor Manuel Fernandez acknowledged, yeah, um, what I said here was rather contingent. And th he said, that's just fine, Africa. You can do whatever you decide is good for your diocese, which shows that he is not holding to it intellectually, and he's not holding to it implementationally practically. So this is not necessary, and it is contingent. And furthermore, this is a paragraph four document because it really is only serving the people of God as well as possible. It was about impaling the church on a fence post and separating it two feet out to two dipole magnets so that the conservatives will go one way to paragraph 31 and the liberals will go the other way to paragraph 4, as you saw. Therefore, this document is obviously a, oh no, what do we do stop gap, so that Pope Francis can show his pals in Davos, Switzerland, that yeah, we're on the dialectic moving forward towards one world government, world socialism which means it wasn't to serve the people of God at all. And so it's not magisterium at all. It's not teaching. It was showing off an example that proves to be insane and a farce in order to put on a show of gay blessings. So it's an act. The whole encyclical is a giant charade, a giant lie. So it's not the third paragraph, as Michael Lofton claims. It's not even the fourth paragraph. It's really none of them. Therefore, going back to Michael Lofton's claims, is it authentic magisterium? Nope. There's nothing new in it, and by that I mean more insightful than previous magisterial thought. There's just governance in it. Do this. Do that. Is it paragraph three? No, it's nothing at all. And then... Does it require religious submission of will and intellect? Darn no! The inner logic is so faulty as to be devoid of faith, and this actually requires religious contempt. And additionally, as we saw, it isn't even to serve the people of God. And lastly, it's a lie. It's a giant lie. And so I'll leave you with this thought. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich says that the prophet Malachi wrote not just conscious of the priests of the old law, but he actually wrote conscious of the priests of the new law, the priests of today. So think of Pope Francis and Fernandez as you read this. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you won't listen, if you won't lay it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse what? Your blessings. Think about that in light of the blessings described in this encyclical. Indeed, I have already cursed them. Why? Because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung upon your faces, Pope Francis and Victor Manuel Fernandez, the dung of your offerings, and I will put you out of my presence. So you shall know that I have sent this command you to you, that my covenant with Levi may hold, says the Lord of hosts. What did Levi do? Levi took up the sword and slaughtered his brethren who had gone and committed the sin of the golden calf. So put that into your pastoralness pipe and smoke it. For God says, my covenant with him was a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear, and he feared who? Feared me, and stood in awe of my name. 
true instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity, not to iniquity, Francis. Not to iniquity, Georg Betzing. For the lips of a priest shall guard knowledge, and men shall seek instruction from his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you have not kept my ways, but have showed partiality in your instruction. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the peace of God be all who are Amen. in the true Israel of God. Amen.